You're listening to Living Out Our Faith in a Fallen World, a series preached from the book of James by Pastor Rick Dressler at Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. Start with verse number 13. James chapter 5 this morning, starting at number verse 13. Um, someone asked me this morning if I would finish the book of James this morning. You, you laugh, as did I. Like, I can stretch this for about three more weeks. I don't know that this is going to be a problem. We will not finish the book today, but we are certainly coming to a close in the book of James this morning. And just to remind you of where we've been and what you need to know, there are 54 imperatives or commands in the book of James. Actually, 60 if you count the hypotheticals. So there are 60 commands for God's people in this short book of five chapters, which means this. For every two verses, one out of two will be a command to God's people. James is bent on realizing that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That for the believer in Christ, we have a Lord and Savior who is King. And He gives us commands on how to live. It is not enough to identify as a Christian or to wear a necklace or a cross around your neck or on your body or even to check the boxes and say, I go to church every week. We have a Lord, we have a Savior. And through his words, we have commands that God is telling his people, this is how I expect you to live. And it's right and wise to heed those commands. Because James wants us who know Christ, who live in a troubled world, to navigate with it and through it with an untroubled heart. And so, last week we saw two imperatives. Look at the text this morning, James chapter 5, we'll just review these quickly. Verse 13, is anyone among you suffering? That is pain, hardship, um, distress. And James says, if you're here like that this morning and you are suffering in any way, you are to pray. That was lame. Okay, I just told you the answer. All right, if you're suffering, you are to pray. pray. Much better. Right? And James is directing us to the appropriate place. We are to start here. Not with my friend, not with my spouse. When we're struggling and suffering, we go to God. He is the appropriate person this morning. This God has created you. This God has called you. This God cares for you. He knows your end from the beginning. He knows where you're at right now. And he tells you, cast your care upon me. Because I care for you. I know. I feel. I'm touched with the feelings of your infirmity. And so, when we're suffering, we we are to pray. And then he says, when you're cheerful, if there's a season that is good, you then are to praise. To praise. He says, praise. Sing a psalm. The singing of a psalm energizes us in our praise. Why? Because a psalm is a reminder. It's the word of God. It gives us substance as we pray, as we praise, right? To remember the God who is the creator of the universe, the one who spoke it all into existence, the one who has been with us and good to us all of our days, the one through his redemption, the son was given to live a life, to save and rescue us to praise, remembering the day that we came to him, to think of his providence in his life, and how he cares for us. It encourages or energizes our praise, and then it encourages God's people. This is a singing church, and I'm glad for it. It's a wonderful thing. But, but we don't just sing in our own moments. We sing to tell truth to one another, and it is in the telling of that truth that we're encouraged. And so this morning, if you're suffering, Pray. If you're in a good season, praise. And now here is a third imperative, and we'll just talk about this one this morning. Verse number 14. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name 
of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. The next imperative that we have, the next command is this. Those who are sick, in a state of weakness or incapacity, to be sick, ill, or disabled, you are to call to the elders. Um, These verses at first glance seem to be innocuous. Like, easy enough. It's simple. It's straightforward. But whether you realize it yet or not, this is one of the most difficult passages in the book of James. And it may be one of the most difficult passages in all of the New Testament. And if you don't see it yet, you will. Um, This is one of the problems that we have when we do expository preaching, which means we take a book and we go through verse by verse. And when you do that, you just can't skip verses. It becomes real obvious that you're annoying or avoiding them. And so we understand this morning we must preach the whole counsel of God and even in difficult verses. And I understand this this morning. I'm going to say some things this morning that I'm sure what I say you will not agree with my conclusion. And I understand this morning there are good and godly people who will look at the text we're going to look at this morning and think, I'm not, I don't buy that, I'm not going there, that's not the way I see it. And that's fine as well this morning. So let's walk through the text and see what we're up against this morning. Look again at verse number 14. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders. So now James is talking to the community, the person who is sick with weakness, incapacity, ill, or disabled. Um, And it seems to indicate that these individuals are outside of the community because of their situation. And he says to these folks, here's the command. If you are sick, if you are struggling with illness, if you are incapacitated, he says it is your responsibility to call on the elders. It's a command. And and the onus then comes on them. So just that you know, and and you think, well, this doesn't make any sense to me. Um, Everything that we will talk about today in this text, we do as a church, which might surprise you, but we practice this. And so James says the onus and responsibility is for the individual who is sick, who has a need. Now listen, in our world and in our culture, and we'll talk more about this later, but we are so individual, individualistic that in our world, we sit and we say, listen, I got a problem, I got an issue, but I'm going to deal with it. I can handle it. I can do this on my own and alone. But my friend, that is not Christianity. That is not the church. You are in a body of believers. And James says, you're away from the community, you're sick, and so it is your obligation to call for the elders of the church. Uh, This is a privilege and a gift for God's people. So he says, you call, and and when he says call, like, it's not this, right? And I say this, and half of our young people have no idea what this is. This used to be called a telephone, right? (laughs) And that we would pick it up off of the wall with a cord on it, and we would call people, like, call me. I know we don't do that today, but that's what we used to do. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about, listen, give notice, call them, let them know where you're at, call your elders. Notice again, that word is plural. It's plural. There is a plurality of elders in the Word of God. And they are men that the church recognizes as spiritual leaders in the church, responsible for the spiritual needs, to feed the flock, to read the Word, to study Scripture, and to take care of the spiritual needs. An elder is not a deacon, and a deacon is not an elder. A deacon is responsible for the physical needs of the church. They're different. They're to call the elders for a spiritual need. Right? Notice this as well. These people who are making the call to their elders, they know their elders. And their elders know them. They're literally doing life together. When they're calling, the elders are not saying, hey, I'm not sure who you are. 
but they know one another. And so they are to call the elders, and then he says, let them pray over you. And so, so far, so good, easy enough. The person's sick, call your elders, let them pray over you. Let's continue. Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And you say, well, what's that about? Well, in the Bible, you, you, you probably know this, that especially olive oil, valuable substance used for everything, from food to fuel. And in, in this context, there are two ideas, I believe, that are happening here. Um, that this idea of anointing with oil is medicinal. That's actually used oftentimes in the Bible as a medicine, and then it is symbolic. You'll find reading the Bible that this idea of anointing with oil is often done for kings, for priests, and prophets. And the idea is that we're anointing them with oil, a symbol of the spirit and power of God. They're sanctified. They're set apart for a special purpose. The idea of the spirit coming upon them. And so James says this anointing of oil is looking for the Lord to heal, his will to be done. And whether it's medicine or not, this is the idea. Now notice he says, we do this in the name of the Lord. As we talk about this context this morning, it is not a prayer that heals. It is not the oil that heals. Ultimately, in every person's life, it is the God of heaven who heals and him alone. It is not a person, it is not a ministry, it's God himself. Now, let's look at verse number 15. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Now, here's where the rub comes, all right? The tense of all three of those statements is future indicative. When James says this prayer of faith is prayed, the saved, the the sick will be saved, they will be raised up, and their sins will be forgiven. James is saying, when this is done, this is real, this will occur. This will occur. This is what will happen. And so the question comes, and if you're thinking now, you see the dilemma. Is this just an unqualified promise? If you do this every time, God promises that this will happen. And that's our dilemma this morning. What do we do with this? Now, let me just say to you, we're going to go through this passage. And at first, it's going to seem like this is just like a glorified Bible study. It is and it is not. Stay with me. We're going to make a point through all of this, all right? What is James talking about? What's going on here? What what is this about? So, just quickly, and again, please, 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 do not check out. We are actually going somewhere. I feel this morning like we're going to do a, we're in a plane and we're at 30,000 feet. We're seeing a lot of stuff. And to be honest, I'm not sure how we're going to land the thing yet, but we're going to land it, okay? So just stay with me. Five ideas. Number one, it's the simplest one. Read the passage, and yes, that's what it says. And every time I do this, God will heal, and God will raise up that person. Now, I'm going to be honest with you this morning. I am fully aware that I come from a tradition, as all of you do. We're we're all raised differently. We all have a tradition. And in my tradition, Baptist, oftentimes as Baptists, and I'm just speaking in my tradition, we have a tendency to put God in a box, right? And so he's in a box, and yes, he heals, and we believe he heals, but he uses doctrine, he uses medicine. Sometimes it happens, and, and we, we run PR for God. Like, yeah, of course, but this and this and this. And I'm aware of that, and we all do this. We have a tradition, and we have a filter that we, we run everything through. And so I'm aware of that this morning as I'm looking at this text. And I want to be honest about that. I don't want to just follow a tradition. They're good and they're bad. They can be either. But we must look at the word of God. And I want to be honest with the text this morning, even understanding that about myself. We have to look at the totality of Scripture this morning. So if you're here this morning and you're not from my, my background and, 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 and the way I view things growing up the way I did, then you might say this morning, hey, Rick, read it. 
That's what it says. Leave it. And that's fine. And if you believe that this morning, we're all said and done. God bless you. I will still love you. But let me just ask you a question. As we look at the totality of Scripture, does that seem to be the case as we work our way through the New Testament? Pastor Andrew just read this morning from 2 Corinthians. And listen, this is not a trick question. Um, The Apostle Paul, the greatest Christian missionary, do you think, and this is a yes and no, do you think he was a good Christian? Yes or no? Okay, wait a minute. That was not a trick question. Okay, the answer is yes. Okay, Paul was a wonderful believer in Christ. So do you think that Paul was a faithful Christian? Yes or no? Okay, good. You're still not convinced, some of you, but believe me, he was. Here is Paul, and Paul goes to the Lord and says, God, I have this thorn. We don't know what it was. But he begs three times, oh, God, take this from me. If there's anyone, on the basis of merit, I know it doesn't work this way. If there's anyone that God would say, Paul, you're a man of faith. You're faithful. You've seen me on the road to Damascus. You know me. Presto, it's done. That's not what happens at all. Matter of fact, God doesn't say yes. He doesn't even say wait. He says no. By the way, all of our prayers are answered with those three statements. Yes, no, and wait. And God says to Paul, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. And in your weakness, I will be glorified. You will be strong in ways you could not imagine. And so you think about the Apostle Paul and you think, of course, he should be the one. But not only Paul, think about his workers, Timothy. Timothy had struggles. And Paul writes to Timothy and says, hey, Timothy, take some meds. You're struggling, man. A little wine for your stomach's sake, whatever you need. And then he had one, Trophimus, that he left sick in Miletus. This is the Apostle Paul. And so you can follow this trajectory if you want to and say, yes, it's what it means every time. But you've got to be honest with those, and you have to answer those. Consider the people of the Bible, but then consider this practically. If this is the case, that every time we come, we pray and God heals and we go on with our life, then why is it that all of us as believers will die? Even if you are healed, people that Jesus healed eventually died because it's appointed to men once to die and after this a judgment. And then on a real practical level for this first interpretation, I have dear family members who, who are in this, this type of situation, and they, they would say to me, Rick, that's what it says. But what happens, if that's what you believe, when it doesn't happen? And you, you worked up your faith. You've examined yourself. You're pleading and begging. There are only two people to blame then. Number one, you. Your faith wasn't enough. There's something in your life. You're the problem. And the second person to blame is God. You're mean, you're unkind, and we wonder why people by droves go away from Christianity. And so you can stay here, and I love you if you do. I just think we've got to be honest, and I've got to be honest this morning too about this. Is that what James means by this text? That's the first one, right? Yes, it is, every time. Number two, and these will go quickly, so stay with me. The second is, um, this is proverbial. James is known as um, the Proverbs of the New Testament. And so this is important for all of us this morning. I don't think Christians understand what a proverb is. A proverb, when we speak of it, is a principle for living. Um, It's general truth. It's like we are in a broken world, and these are the Proverbs, and if you follow these Proverbs, you can live a basically good life. They are generally true, but they are not ironclad. They're not. The Jews understood this. We should understand that. That's a proverb. Let me give you an example. He who walks with wise men shall be wise. That's a proverb. Is that always true? Ah, usually. 
But what about the fool who has a bunch of smart friends who never listens to them and never does anything about it? He's still an idiot. I'm sorry, pardon my language. He's still, yeah. And so, so, so that's who he is. And the proverb is true, and nine times out of ten, that will happen. But we live in a fallen world. And so what some people say is like, James, it's just a proverb, so hey, do this. And yeah, nine out of ten, seven out of ten. And that's how they answer the question. There's a third, apostolic. And, and this is that James is the earliest book that was written in Christianity, probably about 45 A.D. There was no New Testament. The Bible for the Christian was the Old Testament. And so the apostles were given the ability for signs and wonders. And so to authenticate the gospel message, God enabled his apostles to perform wonderful miracles to authenticate Jesus lived, died, rose again, and is alive forevermore. And so what James is writing about here is for James's day and no one else. This window is closed. It doesn't happen. It can't happen. This is what John Calvin believed. He believed that, right? And I don't want to tip my hand this morning, but I think you, but, but I am tipping my hand this morning. So far, I, I'm just not convinced in any of these yet, okay? Here is number four. This is spiritual healing. All that we're talking about here is spiritual. This is John MacArthur's view. And he believes that the sick, and is this true, that word can mean weak. And so we're weak in our flesh. We're weak in our struggle against sin. And what James is dealing with is the suffering and the sin that accompanies it. And he says this because it talks about if you've committed trespasses, if you've committed sin, if you confess. And what he's talking about is a restoration to spiritual wholeness, to spiritual wholeness. So in that view, there is healing always that happens, but it's in a spiritual way. Okay? Here's number five. And, and this, is, this is where I, I come to. All right? And I, I want to say this. Again, you don't have to buy anything I'm saying so far. Even if you're still awake, stay with me. But we can have a conflict of ideas and still have community, Right? This is the beauty of the church of Jesus Christ. This is the way we can do it. It doesn't have to collapse our relationships. The main things are the main things. Christ is alive. The gospel is true, right? We serve a risen Lord. So this this is my idea. Um, The prayer of faith is a special prayer. It is not working up our emotions. It is not whipping the crowd into a frenzy. It is a prayer for healing both physically and spiritually. And the Lord knows we need spiritual healing. We do. We live in a world where we think that we can live any way we want to, and there are no consequences. There is a law of sowing and reaping. And so when we live in a sinful pattern of our life, there will be consequences. That's what reality is. When you hit the wall of what real life is about, And those stem from patterns in our life that we need to be healed from. And not only that, just in our own life, our anger, our pride, our self-righteousness, our bitterness, our unforgiving spirit, these things do impact us and they impact other people. Read Hebrews. So we need healing in this. And so this prayer is a prayer for physical and spiritual healing. There are times when we are praying before our God and whether it's ourself, our family, or our friends, and there's a sense. Of, and, and listen, stay with me. You're going to think I'm crazy in a few minutes. I am, but there's more to come. So just stay with me. There's a sense in a real way that as I pray for this individual in this situation, that God is at work in a way that I know that I know. And I come to a spot in my life that I trust in him, his will. I trust in his peace. I trust where this is going. And I literally trust in the fact that he will heal this individual. This prayer, I believe, is always answered. It is in line with the will of God and his revelation. Now, um, you you might not be convinced on that, and I get it, and that's okay. I'm going to say a couple things right now, three stories. And I know, oh, that's subjective, Rick, or... That's anecdotal, and, and you're not, I get it. But just listen for a moment. 
Because I want to share with you part of the way I've come to this conclusion. And I hope it makes sense. So just bear with me. Years ago, Pastor Dan and Tara came here, and I think his family was young. I don't even know if they had kids yet. It was that long ago. Now they have 25. (laughs) No end in sight. And he was working here, and they were here, this young couple, and his dad got sick, and and his dad was sick. And and I don't think that they, they even realized how sick he was. It was really dire. And so he was in London. I went to the hospital, and uh, I prayed with him and Tammy. I came home, and just a real burden. And, and listen, just you know this. There are times when you pray, and something sticks in your heart, and you cannot. It's like pray, pray, pray. And I was praying, and that week while I was praying, I was scheduled to go see him again on Friday. And on Thursday, as I was praying, I was reading my Bible. Um, now listen to me. I have to say this. Um, we don't find God's will by taking the Bible and saying, God, I don't have to do my life, but here we go. Lord, direct me. Boom. That's not what I'm talking about this morning. The guy who tried that one time, he was confused about God's will, and he said, okay, Lord, show me. Open his Bible. Put it by the window. The page is turned. Put his finger down. And then the verse he read is, Judas went and hanged himself. <laughs> it's a bad idea. So he closed it and did it again. The next spot that he hit down was, go and do likewise. Okay, so that's, <laughs> that's, not, that's not what I'm talking about. And, and listen to me, we, I did this as a kid. I'd open up the Bible and say, okay, Lord, show me, bomb. And then somehow, somebody's is going to make that apply to me. That's not what I'm talking about this morning at all, at all. Praying for Dan's dad, burdened about it, serious situation. That morning, I was in Psalm 41.3. And here's what I read after praying with this burden on my mind. The Lord will strengthen him on his bed of illness. You will sustain him on his sickbed. Okay? Not looking, not, I'm not kidding you. When I read that verse, there was a sense that came over me. It was like, oh God, they're going to heal Peter. And, and I, I knew that I knew. I went to the hospital and I didn't tell him that because I, I didn't think he, I, I wasn't sure. I knew that I knew, but I wasn't going to tell him that just in case it didn't happen. Right? <laughs> That's just, I want to guard myself here. But I, I, actually I believe it now, maybe I didn't believe it, but I did believe it. And I prayed with him, I shared those verses, it was a blessing to Dan's mom and dad, and sure enough, Peter was healed, he's with us today, and we praise the Lord for it. Right? Yeah, amen. Right, so, now stay with me on these stories, because this is not, it's like, I got another one for you, right? This is not, I want you to listen. 2022, Ian Cameron, Cancer. It was bad. Bad. I went over to talk with Ian, and when I was sitting with him, he was talking about the diagnosis. It was, it was bad. I remember leaving that day with Judy, walking out to the garage, just embracing her and weeping because we we're losing him. The next week I came back. He's sitting in his chair, and he's like really pumped up and excited. It's like, what's going on? He said, I have to show you. I can't even do Scottish. Rah, 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 right? Rah, 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 right? I want to show you what the Lord has showed me, and I'm going to be healed. And so right now, it's like, okay, he's taking medication. I don't know where he's at. <laughs> then he shows me this verse. And this doesn't, and, okay, I'm just going to read the verse. Exodus 23, 20. Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and bring you into the place which I prepared. And so I'm listening, like, okay, is that heaven? What are you talking about? And then he reads verse 29. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate. And it goes on, verse 30 says, little by little I will drive them out. And Ian went on to tell me that as he's been praying for this situation, that, the God said, that God said to him, listen, Ian, it's going to be a year. And little by little we're going to get through this, and you're going to be fine. And so Ian tells me that. He's rejoicing, and I'm thinking, no way. That, that is not, we don't do things like that. Ian, he pulled that out of context. We, we look at the context, man. And so I walked out and I just thought, God bless him. That's, Ian Cameron's sitting here this morning. Right? Right. Amen. Now, stay with me. Let me give you one more.
Carolyn Walker's sister, Susan. Godly, godly woman. She's diagnosed with ALS. You know that diagnosis, right? Godly, her whole life, godly example. She was the epitome of what a Christian woman should look like. And so she gets the diagnosis, and she's praying and pleading with God. And in her daily, not, not flipping this over, in her daily devotion, God, how do you want me to deal with this? What am I supposed to do? And here's where she opened that morning, Jeremiah 30, verses 12 through 13. For thus says the Lord, your affliction is incurable. Your wound is severe. There is no one to plead your cause that you may be bound up. You have no healing medicine. What did you do with that word of the Lord? She accepted it. And from that moment, she lived a life that exemplified the peace and the hope and the joy of Jesus Christ in the midst of all of it. And by the way, she was healed in the presence of Jesus Christ when she saw him face to face. You understand that? Now listen to me, my friend. Think what you want on what I said. But I want to tell you something. I've been on both sides of this. We have seen the good and the bad. When Katie was struggling with the twins, we wept, we begged, we pleaded, we fasted, we sought his face. We, we said, oh God, save them. Never an idea like, hey, it's going to be okay. Never. But we, we settled in this idea that, Lord, you are good. We want your will. You are in control. I will trust you even in this. And Harper was healed, seeing the face of Jesus. Do you understand? And so, do what you want with that. But I'm telling you, this is where I fall. And, and this is where I am right now. And so, what do we do with this now? Like, okay, that was an okay Bible study. So what do we do with this now? Let me just give you two thoughts as we close. Number one, I want you to see in our text the idea of community. Community. Um, again, we are in an individualistic culture. You have heard this. Maybe you've said this. I don't need the church. I'm going to worship in the woods. Can you worship God in the woods? Yes, you can worship him anywhere. But can I tell you something? Um, that's not God's plan. You say, I've been adopted. And the truth of the matter is, if you're in Christ this morning, you have been adopted. The God of heaven has lavished you with his love. You are chosen. You are elect. He died for you. He cares for you. He saved you. He gave his son for you. You are adopted. You are a son or a daughter of God. But listen to me. You have been adopted into a family. A family. We are not just to look inward and be navel gazers. Oh, look at how great I am. We're to look outward into what we've been brought into. James is writing to a people outside the community who truly know their elders, their elders know them, they're doing life together. Listen, this is the church. And for too many of us, we're individuals, I don't need that, or we hide and pretend. Again, you can be impressive. From afar. But you will not be known. And inside every one of us, the longing of the human heart is, I want to be fully known and fully loved. That's the beauty of Christ. He knows you intimately. He knows your thoughts afar off. He knows your past. He knows it all. And he loves you. Right? And so, James is writing to these people who are doing life together. Years ago, Pastor Dan and I were in Cleveland staying with my brother. Um, remember that, Dan? And so we had a conversation. My brother was not going to church. And um, in the conversation, it lasted well into the night. He said, hey, Rick, tell me um, what it is that I can't do as a Christian that I have to have church for. Uh, what do I need that for? And I said to him, brother, you can't do anything. 
without the church of Jesus Christ. How do you do the one another's? Honor, love, forgive, preferring. Well, I do that to people outside. Yeah, easy enough. How about people you're rubbing shoulders with, warts and all? How's that going for you? We need the community of Christ. We need it. The church community, when it acts like the Bible tells it to act, when we're concerned for the physical and spiritual needs of one another, when we're literally doing life with one another, when we love each other, taking meals, making calls, making visits, having coffee, being together, the world looks into that and it blows their mind. Why? Because you have people from every walk of life that should not be able to sit with each other. Do you know what a mutt is, right? A mutt, right? It's a dog that who knows where it's been, right? And who its mother's, it's, it's a mix of everything. This church, and I say this in love and respect, <laughs> is not a pure breed. Mm-hmm. It's a mutt. It's a mutt. Every walk, every background, every many ethnic groups, we have this morning sitting in this, in this church under one roof, without a fight yet, Baptist, Pentecostals, Mennonite, Old Colony, Reformed maybe, right? Um, who am I missing? What? Alliance. Alliance, Brethren, yeah. Who else? Catholics, yes. Anglican. Oh, we're getting, I keep on going, all right. All right, who else? Right, right? Orthodox, yes. Do you see? So, when James is talking about this community, this is what he's talking about. And it's glorious. And the world looks in and it blows their mind. This is the purpose. This is the wisdom of God. And so, my brother and sister, listen, don't be on the fringe. Be part of this place. We have growth groups. We have small groups. We have activities. We have work days. We have events. Find somebody. Fellowship. Know them and be known. It will change your life, man. Those people are weird. Yeah. Yes. I've been here for 24 years. They're all weird. And it starts from the top. How do I learn to love people like me? I don't have to. They're perfect like me. But when they're not like me, this is where it's only done through the Spirit of God. There is no answer for this. And that's the beauty of the church. So I want you to consider as we leave community, and then I want you to consider communion with God. Don't miss the point. The point is not, boy, what can I do to get the prayer of faith so everything I touch turns to gold? You've missed it. There should be something within us that longs to have a prayer life where, God, you're communicating with me, you're talking with me, you're directing me. I want this. But let me ask you this. If that's your desire this morning, for whatever that would look like, are you praying? Stop and think. Oh, I'd love to experience or have or know. Okay. Are you praying? An old preacher years ago was preaching, and and there was a little five-year-old sitting in the front row. And he said, moms, do you pray? Dads, do you pray? And the little boy said, no. (laughs) True words have not been spoken. But we talk about it, and we long for it. We do not do it. I think for many of us this morning, we are practicing atheists. What have you done this week that is any different from your lost friend, neighbor, or family member? And God has given us the ability to come into his presence and speak with him. And we're too busy on TikTok, on Facebook, and our exercise. What are we doing? Francis Schaeffer wrote a book, a fantastic book. Speaking of God, um, God is there and is not silent. My brother and sister this morning, 
We serve the living Christ who is alive and well, and he will walk with me and talk with me along life's narrow way. This is our God. And he deserves our glory. He deserves our praise. And he invites us into his presence to talk with him, to bring everything before him. And as I do that, I am in touch now with the God of heaven, with the spirit of God. I can see clearly my path. I pray to him. I'm sensitive to his leading. I'm uh, in line with his desires. And my spirit is in tune with his. Could you imagine, honestly, this morning, if we would be serious about our community and about our communion with God, the things that could be done that no one could take glory for other than Jesus, which, by the way, is our sole purpose. Our sole purpose. So, this morning, only two things for you to do. Community, I say two things, I'm just saying for this morning, there's lots to do. Community and communion, right? Now you've heard. Now do something about it. Do something about it. Too many of our spiritual lives are superficial, man. This is it. This is your spirituality. Check your box. You're gone. I'll see you next week. That, that, that ain't going to make it. That will not sustain you. That will not build you. That will not strengthen you. That, that will not do it. Communion and communion. Now do something about it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. I thank you for the folks who are so kind to listen. I pray that, that something today resonated in their hearts and lives that, that would be strength and nourishment and hope and help. God, we love you. Forgive us of our wandering. Forgive us of our complacency. Forgive us of our superficial relationship with you. Help us to love the church because you died for it. And help us to communicate with you because we can. Because we can. Thank you. So bless this time of invitation, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening. If you would like to learn more about what you've just heard or are interested in the ministry of Maple City, please visit our website at maplecitybaptistchurch.com.